Good morning. September 13th, 2020, already the middle of September. We started the month of September a series on prayer, and we're continuing that today for the sermon entitled, Lord, Something's Gotta Change. Today in our worship service, we're also taking the opportunity to uh, honor John Adams as he is uh, stepping away, and uh, we want to uh, offer the opportunity for you to uh, reach out to him as well. And so uh, thank you for being a part of our worship time today, wherever you may be, whenever you may be watching. We pray that God will speak to you as we share this with you today. And so God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our worship time today. The Lord is near to all who call on him. and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. In the sanctuary of solitude are the gathering of many. In whisper are shout. He is near. The title again is, Lord, Something's Gotta Change, a sermon on prayer. There's three pieces to it today, uh, all of which I think should sound fairly familiar to you. Lord, I'm in trouble. Lord, my heart is broken. And Lord, I can't do it on my own. There's an old saying that says there are no atheists in foxholes. The phrase is generally attributed to a military chaplain in 1942 while speaking to American troops on Bataan. Surrounded by an unforgiving and brutal enemy with no hope of relief, the chaplain was pointing out that when your life is hanging in the balance and you are at the end of your own options, and you realize there's no longer any other outside human options available, you will instinctively turn to God for help. Psychologists, even atheist psychologists, will tell you that human beings are hardwired to believe in God. At our core, when all else fails us, we call out to God. Lord, something's got to change. Lord, something's got to give. And Lord, I don't know how to go on from here. One of my suggestions to people who are going through that is to turn to the book of Psalms, the Bible's hymn book. Psalms, to a large extent, is a collection of, of prayers that... The Hebrews put to music. Psalm 9, verses 13 and 14 says, Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. This is a Psalm of David. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You lifted me up from the gates of death. We forget how human so many of our Bible heroes are. There at the gates of death, surrounded by people who hate him. This was King David. So when we look in Scripture, when we look specifically in Psalms, we are looking at the prayers and hymns of people who have been where we are. And we see the path they took to find their way out. One of the most common prayers we pray is, Lord, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. That's what David was praying there in Psalm 9. And in Exodus chapter 3, we have God's encounter with Moses. 
And so in verses 6 through 9, God says to Moses, I am the Lord God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hizite, and the Amorite and the Perizzite, and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. When we're in trouble, real trouble, our world becomes very small. We aren't concerned about the things that are happening on the other side of the planet. We're not particularly interested in who won the ball game. All we can think about is how bad our situation is, how much trouble we're in. And we develop a, a case of selective amnesia. We forget that we've been in trouble before, or that those close to us whose situation and story we know well have been in the same trouble we're in, or worse, and yet somehow it all came out okay. But we forget that, selective amnesia. We forget, if we ever even realized, that God was there there as a guide, there as a protector, there as a healer, there to be whatever he needed to be to get his lambs safely home. And God is with you in your time of trouble, even before you call to him. God tells Moses that he is the God of the past, the present, and the future. I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I've heard the cry right now of where my people are in Egypt, and I'm going to take them to a land in the future, a land of flowing with milk and honey. The God of the past, the present, and the future. He was neither surprised nor stumped by Israel's trouble. I have seen their pain, God says. I have heard their cry. So when we are in trouble and we cry out to God, we can do so knowing that God is neither surprised nor stumped by our situation. As if our little life contained troubles too great for the king of the universe. And a little life though it may be. But it is still a life hugely precious to that king of the universe. The Bible uses a lot of agrarian images to convey a picture of what God is like, a shepherd, a sower. As a boy, I spent my summers on the family farm in Tennessee. My great uncle George ran the farm. He had all the varieties of animals that you may guess, and many of each of them. But there was not one that wasn't precious to him. He would rise before the sun and not quit until after sundown, so that he might see to the needs of each and every animal. If one of us should, should so care for his flocks, how much more our Father in heaven, for he is the Good Shepherd. So when we pray, Lord, I'm in trouble, he knows and he is able. Another prayer we often pray is, Lord, my heart is broken. Situational troubles can be hard. You're surrounded by an enemy on Bataan. You've lost your job. You've lost your business, perhaps in the time of COVID. You've lost your home to a fire or a hurricane. Yet, one day, you're released from the prison camp. You get to go home. You survived although you don't know how. Or one day you find a new job 
and you can start fixing your bank account, your credit score, your retirement, though you may have to work a few years longer. You're still holding everything together, although you don't know how. Or you rebuild your home. You pull together a few things from the wreckage of the old home to be able to place in your new home. And in a year, maybe two, things seem to start feeling normal, although you don't know how. Well, God was there, though perhaps you didn't know how. But troubles of emotion, troubles of the heart, mm, that's a different burden. These are troubles that are wrapped in darkness and fog. It's hard to see. A heart with a clogged artery may be repaired, but a broken heart cannot be mended by spending a few days in the hospital. These are troubles that are too deep for scalpels, too deep for words. And time, time alone cannot heal. We feel utterly alone, perhaps even forsaken by God. Out of our desperation, in our darkness, we cry out to God, and He hears. There's a wonderful story in Mark chapter 5. In verses 22 through 24, and then on down below in verses 35 through 42, The Word of God tells us that one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him, seeing Jesus, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And then down in verse 35, while he was speaking, they came to the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus overhearing what was bespoken said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion, and people were loudly weeping and wailing. Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha, whom, which translated means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was twelve years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. What was it Jesus said to the man? Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. Fear is the putrid infection of the broken heart. It is fear that paralyzes us. It is a tool of Satan to break us as he whispers that our heart will never heal, that our life will be only and always in darkness. We hear a voice of hopelessness. Nothing can be done to fix your heart. Why do you trouble the teacher anymore? And the Spirit of Jesus answers back, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. So you push on with just a single ray of light shining through the darkness. What you don't realize is, is that it may take time to rid you of the infection of fear. One washing may not do. A few times through the, spin through the spin cycle may be required. Fear clings to us hard. But trust, trust. Even if people around you laugh at you, 
and laugh at the idea that soon you will emerge out of the darkness. Even if fear pulls you hard against you, don't take a step back. Keep praying, listening to the Spirit of Jesus. If you can't move forward, put your life in park. Set the brake. Wait on Jesus to speak power to you. Look at yourself in the mirror and confess, I don't know if God hears me. I don't know where he is or what he's doing. And then remind yourself that he loves you. And that whatever he is doing, even if you can't see it, his actions come from deep within his love for you. And your healing, whatever that may mean, whatever it may look like, is his ultimate goal for your life. Another prayer that we pray commonly, just out of desperation, is, Lord, I can't do it on my own. The 40th Psalm is 17 verses long. Let's take a look at those 17 verses. Verses 1 and 2 say, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. Stuff happens. We never plan on drowning or getting swallowed up in quicksand or stuck in clay that we can't move in. We never plan on getting in situations that on our own we can never get out of. But God is able and God is willing. And when you're down in that pit, when you're stuck and you can't get out, and if you can't move if you can't climb out on your own, you're not going to make it. Cry out to him, and he will lift you up and lift you out. Verses 3 through 5 says that he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done, and your thoughts toward us, there is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Brothers and sisters, God doesn't want you to simply not die, nor even just merely exist, merely just getting by. He wants you to live. And the singular quality of living, this Christ-like living that springs out of you, is joy. Joy. On Wednesday nights, we're in 1 Peter, and we recently finished Philippians. Paul is writing Philippians from prison in Rome, and he truly doesn't expect to ever walk out of there. Yet all he can talk about is joy. And he encourages the Philippians to discover the joy that there in Christ he has found. And how do you find it? Well, by trusting God. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust, verse 4 tells us. You, you discover that joy by trusting God. And he encourages the Philippians to truly find the joy that he has found in Christ. Because even in prison, under a sentence of death, you can have joy. Joy that pours out of trusting in God. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. David goes on in verses 6 through 10. He says, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is written in my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, 
I will not restrain my lips, O Lord. You know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. As we pray, we learn to trust God. As we look back to see two sets of footprints through the pathway of our life. One big set of footprints, one small. We see the places where there was only one set of footprints, the big ones, where those were the places in our life where he carried us because we couldn't go on our own. We see, looking back over our shoulder, how many times he's been there for us, unseen yet powerful, lifting us up out of the pit, and unconsciously, without realizing, we have grown to love him and trust him more and more. And his joy pours out of us, As David says, we cannot restrain our lips. We cannot keep from telling people about how he has saved us a thousand times. And finally, in verses 11 through 17, You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. For evils beyond number have surrounded me, and my iniquities have overtaken me, so that I'm not able to see They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha! Aha! Let all who seek you Rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, my God. He is always with me. As he and I talk every day, I know he is close and that he loves me. Verse 12 says, For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I, my sin has overtaken me, is really what it's saying, so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. So often my life is a mess. From the evil that surrounds me to my own sinful weakness, and my heart has failed me, I have no resolve, no strength. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Be pleased, O Lord, verse 13 says, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. And he does. He rescues me. Today, tomorrow, every day. It doesn't matter how often I call on him, cry out to him. He is there. There is not a limited amount of tokens in my hand so that once I use them all up, that's it. No, he is with me always. And I, as I, as I come through again and again, out of the darkness into the light, from the pit up to a solid rock, people ask me, how, how, how do you get through all of that? And I just point to him. And give him praise. It isn't me. Lord, I can't do it on my own. Verse 17 says, Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Lord, Lord, something's got to change. And I know it's my heart. Lord, something's got to give. And I know what it does, when it snaps and it all falls to pieces, you will hear my cry and you will be there to pick me up, heal what is broken, renew my heart, and I will magnify your name. I will magnify your name. Let those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Amen.
Thank you for being a part of our worship time today. You know, as we just look back on recent times, as First Baptist Sweetwater has gone through COVID, that's a good example of what we're talking about. On our own, we couldn't do it. Only by the Spirit of God have things been able to come together the way that they have. Our, our worship, our children's ministry, our student ministry, all of that is just coming together in such an amazing way. And it's not us. It's just the Spirit of Jesus moving and working. As we lift Him up, He is building His church from the little ones to the oldest. And we are grateful. So thank you for all of your support, for wanting to be a part of this amazing thing that God is doing right here in our own church, in our own time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your tithes and your offerings. Thank you just for your presence. And we just pray that this blesses you today as you go through tough times. Go back to those passages in Mark and in Psalms and in Exodus. Go back to them, read them. Know that the same God that was there for the children of Israel, the same God that was there for a grieving father, the same God that was there for David is the same God that's there for you. And so God bless you. If you need us to help you to pray, we'd be glad to. We'd love to be able to go with you uh, down the tough road. We're not afraid of that because our God is an awesome God. He hears us when we cry out. So thank you for being a part of our worship time today. God bless.